If the Medici family were around today, they'd probably look at the Forbes rich list and chuckle. With a fortune that, in today's terms, would make them literal trillionaires, they were the kind of rich that makes today's billionaires seem like they're scrimping and saving for a rainy day. Indeed, the House of Medici didn't just have money, it had we-could-buy-countries-for-fun money. But Europe's ultimate financial old-money family weren't just spending for spending's sake. They were the original creators of modern finance. They didn't just invent the rule book of banking. They wrote it, published it, and sold it at a profit. Yet, behind all of this financial wheeling and dealing, there's a delicious irony. While they were busy counting their florins, they inadvertently became the reason that Protestant Christianity even exists. The Medici family members who became popes with their love for the finer things in life got under Martin Luther's skin so badly that he hammered his 95 theses onto the church door like a divine eviction notice. It's like hosting a dinner party and accidentally founding a new religion in the process. Meanwhile, in the world of art, the Medici were the ultimate talent scouts. They didn't just cheer on the greatest artists of all time, they practically paid for the Renaissance dream team. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Donatello all got their starts directly from the Medici millions having a penchant for artistic endeavor. It's as if this European old money dynasty had a sixth sense for genius, along with a bottomless wallet to fund it. In essence, the Medici were the ultimate Renaissance multitaskers, part bankers, part religious revolution starters, part art aficionados. And in today's episode, we tell their full saga as we describe the Medici family, the family that owned the Renaissance. In the dazzling and tumultuous realm of Renaissance Florence, the Medici family ascended as an unparalleled titan of wealth and power, reigning supreme in both opulence and sway. Indeed, in terms of financial power and political clout, the Medicis were arguably the most powerful dynasty in European history, and now this eminent family ascended to power in an environment that was as complex as it was captivating. Florence, during their time, wasn't just any run-of-the-mill feudal trading hub. It was a city-state. In other words, a city that operates as an independent political entity, with its own government, army, and, in many cases, currency. Furthermore, the Medici family's rise to prominence was intricately linked to Florence's political framework. Governed through a mix of elected councils and influential guilds, the city's governance was a complex tapestry of democracy and oligarchy. The guilds, which were associations of artisans and merchants, played a pivotal role in the city's economy and politics, and members of these guilds, often wealthy and influential, had the power to vote and hold office, thus directly impacting the governance of Florence. Thus, the Medici family, shrewd and ambitious, skillfully navigated this political landscape. They leveraged their economic success and social connections to gain influence within these guilds and councils. And over time, they managed to embed themselves deeply into the very fabric of Florentine society. Their ascent to power, beginning in 1434 and enduring until 1737, was marked by the establishment of the Medici Bank. Under the astute leadership of Giovanni de Bici de' Medici, this financial institution grew to become the most powerful bank in the whole of Europe. And the creation of such a banking powerhouse in Renaissance Florence required not only financial acumen, but also a keen understanding of the social and political dynamics of the time. You see, the Medici family's adeptness in nurturing relationships with the city's elite and leveraging the political landscape enabled them to establish and expand their banking empire. And the Medici Bank's network spanned across pivotal European cities, including Milan, Venice, Rome, London and Barcelona, and many others. But the Medici family's dominance in Renaissance Europe wasn't confined to secular finance. They also wielded significant control over the papal treasury, intertwining their influence with the Catholic Church. Indeed, this treasury, crucial for funding church operations and activities like cathedral construction, art commissions, and maintenance of clerical roles, was a pivotal power source in both political and religious spheres. Thus, through this control, the Medici expanded their reach beyond mere commerce and banking, leveraging the church's vast societal influence. Furthermore, in terms of financial innovation, the Medici were trailblazers. In a masterstroke reminiscent of modern financial acumen, the Medici family introduced the letter of credit, revolutionizing Renaissance commerce. 
This instrument was a harbinger of banking convenience, allowing merchants to traverse the continent without the cumbersome need to carry cash, significantly mitigating the risk of theft. A simple yet potent promise from the Medici banks, the letter of credit was a precursor to the modern-day check, fundamentally transforming the movement of money and trade across distances. And simultaneously, the Medici were pioneering the holding company concept. This savvy business structure, where a parent entity owned shares in various companies, provided them with control over diverse operations without direct involvement in day-to-day -day affairs. This strategic foresight not only consolidated the Medici power and wealth, but also laid the foundation for the corporate governance structures that are now commonplace in today's business world. Thus, in an age where such financial and corporate innovations were rare, the Medici's methods were not just ahead of their time, they were a blueprint for centuries of economic advancement. And the Medici's financial clout in today's terms would leave us all speechless. For example, Giovanni di Michi de' Medici, a forefather of this illustrious family, amassed a fortune equal to $36 million in his time, a staggering sum for the era. And if we were to apply a simplified inflation calculation, assuming, say, a rate of 3% over approximately 600 years, Giovanni's wealth balloons to an astonishing 1.8 trillion, yes, trillion with a T, in today's dollars. But the Medici wealth didn't peak with Giovanni. Historically, it is said that the family's net worth is pegged at around 129 billion US dollars. Using the same inflation approach, this figure skyrockets to a simply incomprehensible $6.5 quadrillion in contemporary terms. It's a figure that is larger than the entire GDP of the world, and thus it is indeed crucial to approach these calculations with a grain of salt. They rely on a straightforward mathematical model that doesn't fully account for the complex economic and historical shifts over six centuries. Nevertheless, these estimates give a glimpse into the extraordinary wealth and influence the Medici wielded. However, the Medici legacy is as much linked to their unrivaled patronage of the arts as to their monumental financial acumen. Their support nurtured the genius of Donatello, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, among others, turning their home city of Florence, originally a military camp established by Julius Caesar, into a hub of creativity, intellect and splendor from the 13th century onward. And even further, the Medici dynasty's impact went beyond arts and finance, venturing into the realm of politics and nobility. Their dominance over several centuries was so absolute that they crafted new noble titles for themselves, cementing their status in history. Indeed, from the moment the Medici family secured control over the papal treasury, their influence rapidly became apparent to the contemporary pontiff. He remarked about the family's patriarch, Cosimo de' Medici, with a mix of awe and perhaps a hint of trepidation. Political questions are settled in Cosimo's house, he declared. He is who decides peace and war, he is king in all but name. Yet this ascent to almost unparalleled eminence was rooted in a past shrouded in myth and legend. It's said that the Medici lineage can be traced back to the time of Charlemagne himself, which is where our next chapter picks up. It is said that the Medici lineage can be traced back to the time of Charlemagne, a figure of immense importance in European history. Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, reigned as the King of the Franks and Lombards and later as the Emperor of the Carolingian Empire. His reign, spanning from 768 to 814 AD, marked a period of cultural and political resurgence, often referred to as the Carolingian Renaissance. The Medici family law goes that Averardo, a knight in Charlemagne's service, encountered and defeated a giant in the Mugello region, just north of Florence. This heroic feat supposedly left Averardo's shield adorned with dents from the giant's mace, a symbol later immortalized in the Medici family's coat of arms, a series of red balls on a gold shield. However, the real journey of the Medici family to prominence began much later. The true ascent of the Medici begins not on a battlefield, but in the humble lanes of the Tuscan village of Cafagiolo, and their journey to Florence marked the transition from mere merchants to influential figures. The path wasn't smooth, however. A notable bump occurred in 1382 when Salvestro de' Medici, then Gonfalonier of Florence, faced exile amidst accusations of tyranny. This was a temporary setback in the family's otherwise upward trajectory when the Medici's true rise to power 
began with Giovanni de Bici de' Medici. Initially a wool merchant, Giovanni capitalized on Italy's strategic position as a trade nexus between the East and the West. First, the Medici's 14th century Italian peninsula had access to the rich markets of the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world, including regions as far as India, bringing in a variety of luxury goods, including silks, spices, and precious stones. Additionally, Italy's extensive coastline and well-developed maritime capabilities allowed for efficient sea trade. Italian city-states, like Venice and Genoa, became crucial maritime powers, operating fleets that dominated the Mediterranean trade routes. Moreover, Italy's position as a gateway to the rest of Europe meant that it was perfectly situated to distribute these goods from the east to European markets. The trade routes through Italy not only included maritime paths, but also a network of roads traversing the Alps and leading into the heart of Europe. This made Italian cities vital centers for trade and banking, attracting merchants, bankers, and entrepreneurs from all over the continent. In this context, Giovanni's business acumen found fertile ground, and the bustling trade environment provided ample opportunity for a wool merchant to prosper. Next, his fortunes took a significant turn in 1397 with the establishment of the Medici Bank, and while it was initially just a side venture alongside Giovanni's wool workshops, the future financial behemoth quickly became his primary focus, largely due to the lucrative and expanding opportunities in the financial sector of that era. Specifically, the burgeoning growth in trade and commerce across Europe was, at the time, accompanied by an increasing need for sophisticated financial services. These included currency exchange, credit facilities, and handling of large transactions, especially for the affluent and the governing classes, and the Medici Bank, with its innovative practices, filled this gap effectively. Furthermore, Giovanni's alignment with Pope Martin V was a strategic move that propelled the bank's success. At the time, Pope Martin V desired to re-establish the papacy permanently in Rome, after the Western Schism had multiple claimants to the papacy emerging, causing significant religious and political strife. The return of the papacy to Rome thus symbolized a return to traditional religious authority and stability, and by supporting Pope Martin V in this endeavor, Giovanni Medici positioned himself and his bank favorably within the realms of ecclesiastical and secular power. And this role not only elevated the status of the Medici Bank, but also granted it access to vast financial networks and significant transactions across Europe. Thus, the management of the Apostolic Chamber marked the beginning of the Medici's long-standing relationship with the papacy, intertwining their banking operations with the politics and finances of the Catholic Church. This connection was instrumental in the ascent of the Medici Bank to becoming one of the most powerful and influential financial institutions of the Renaissance, cementing the Medici family's status as key financial players and later as major patrons of art and culture. However, Giovanni's death in 1429 would not mark the end of the Medici influence. His son, Cosimo, wouldn't just expand his father's legacy, he arguably would eclipse it by leaps and bounds. In the historical landscape of the Medici family, Cosimo de' Medici emerges as a pivotal figure, transforming Florence into a cradle of Renaissance art and culture. Indeed, Francesco Gicciardini, the renowned author of The History of Italy, encapsulates Cosimo's influence eloquently by stating, Cosimo de' Medici was a citizen of rare wisdom and inestimable riches, and therefore most celebrated all over Europe, especially because he had spent over 400,000 ducats in building churches, monasteries, and other sumptuous edifices, not only in his own country, but in many other parts of the world, doing all this with admirable magnificence and truly regal spirit, since he'd been more concerned with immortalizing his name than providing for his descendants. Now, one of the keys to Cosimo's power was a governance structure known as the Citizen Signoria. Within it, Florence was administrated by a group of nine officials, chosen bi-monthly by the city's guilds. This arrangement facilitated Cosimo's substantial influence, enabling him to preside over the city with a quasi-monarchical authority, despite its republican framework. And Cosimo's approach to consolidating power was subtle yet effective. 
Instead of relying on brute force, he favored the arts as a means of reaffirming the Medici's dominance, truly evident in his commission of artworks that portrayed him as mythological figures like Orpheus. This practice of self-glorification through art would become a hallmark of the Medici dynasty, extending to future generations. But Cosimo's most enduring legacy lies in his patronage of the arts. He supported luminaries such as Fra Angelico, Fra Filippo Lippi, and Donatello, and his commitment to culture further extended beyond the visual arts. For example, he was instrumental in the establishment and stocking of the public library in Florence, and to ensure the library's richness, he employed a book scout tasked with acquiring manuscripts from Greek and Islamic sources. And in a move that was both innovative and impactful, Cosimo is said to have pioneered the practice of channeling personal wealth into public projects, particularly in the realm of architecture and urban development. This approach marked a significant departure from the prevailing norms of the time, where private wealth was often hoarded or spent on personal luxuries. Through these endeavors, Cosimo not only cemented his family's legacy, but also set a precedent for the fusion of private wealth and public benefit, a concept that would profoundly shape the cultural and architectural landscape of Florence. And among his most, despite their close ties with the papacy, the Medicis were not exempt from religious scrutiny, particularly regarding the alleged sin of usury, the practice of charging excessive interest on loans. The Medici family navigated this challenge with strategic financial maneuvers, and as historical accounts suggest, the Medici family came up with several ingenious ways of avoiding the church's definition of usury while still making a profit on the money they loaned. One way they did this was by offering loans to trading partners in return for access to below the market rate prices. For instance, they would lend to English wool merchants in return for being able to buy wool cheaper than their trading competitors. Furthermore, Cosimo's life was marked not just by cultural achievements, but also by political power. He became the Duke of Ferrara and served as a banker to Venice, and his influence and power were such that even amidst political rivalries and a brief exile from Florence, his contributions to the city and the country were undeniable. Following the death of Cosimo de' Medici in 1466, he was posthumously honored with the title Pater Patriae, which translates to Father of the Country. Cosimo's son, Piero di Cosimo de' Medici, succeeded him in the family's leadership. However, Piero's tenure at the helm of the Medici dynasty was brief. He passed away just three years later in 1469 due to lung disease. However, it would be Piero's son, Lorenzo de' Medici, often referred to as Lorenzo the Magnificent, who would perhaps outdo all Medici family members before and after him in power and cultural prominence. Now, when you think of the Medici's connection to the Renaissance, you are most likely thinking of the contributions given by the family during the reign of Lorenzo de' Medici, aptly nicknamed the Magnificent. His blend of studiousness and diplomatic prowess brought unprecedented prosperity and renown to the Medici name, and Lorenzo's era represented a shift in the family's image, marked by a more flamboyant and grandiose approach. Born in 1449 in Florence, Lorenzo's early life was steeped in the rich cultural and political environment of Florence, and he quickly exhibited a keen intellect and a strong interest in the arts and literature. He received an education that was comprehensive for its time, encompassing not only the humanities and classics, but also an understanding of politics and economics. And he indeed received tutelage under some of the era's most respected scholars. He studied under notable teachers like Gentile de Becchi and Marsilio Ficino. Ficino, a key figure in the revival of Neoplatonism, deeply influenced Lorenzo's philosophical and cultural outlook and Lorenzo's early life was further marked by his engagement in the family's banking business and diplomatic missions in politics. In 1466, at the age of 17, he was instrumental in resolving a dispute between the city's leading families, showcasing his emerging talents in negotiation and conflict resolution. And in 1469, following the death of his father, the 20-year-old Lorenzo assumed the leadership of the Medici family. Despite his youth, he quickly demonstrated remarkable diplomatic skills and a deep understanding of the intricate power dynamics at play in Renaissance Italy. Now, Lorenzo's era represented a shift in the Medici family's approach to their public image and influence. 
While maintaining the family's traditional roles in banking and commerce, Lorenzo adopted a more flamboyant and grandiose style. For example, he was known for his lavish lifestyle and his magnificent celebrations and festivals, which not only showcased the Medici family's wealth, but also reinforced their status as cultural leaders. Furthermore, under Lorenzo's guidance, the Medici became synonymous with the flowering of Renaissance art and culture. Two of the most notable beneficiaries of his patronage were Michelangelo and Sandro Botticelli, both of whom spent significant time learning their craft at the Medici Palace, an epicenter of Renaissance art and intellectualism. For instance, Michelangelo, who came under Lorenzo's patronage at a young age, was given an unparalleled opportunity to study under the tutelage of the prominent artist Bertoldo di Giovanni at the Medici's own sculpture garden. This garden housed an impressive collection of classical statues, which greatly influenced Michelangelo's early development as a sculptor. And the Medici Palace is thus seen as both a home and a vibrant artistic workshop for Michelangelo, where he was exposed to the philosophical and artistic discussions that were a staple of Lorenzo's court. Similarly, Sandro Botticelli benefited greatly from Lorenzo's patronage by staying at the Medici Palace, with Botticelli being exposed to the same intellectually stimulating environment that nurtured Michelangelo. Botticelli's work, renowned for its expressive portrayal of mythological and religious themes, reflects the Neoplatonic ideals that were popular in Lorenzo's circle and passed on from his aforementioned tutor. His famous works, such as the Birth of Venus and Primavera are believed to have been commissioned by the Medici and are indicative of the creative freedom and support that Lorenzo provided. Indeed, Lorenzo's fascination with splendor and beauty is evident in his own writings. In an unfinished commentary on love and beauty, he mused, and above all, love is the cause that leads men to worthy and excellent endeavors and leads them to practice and to turn into action those virtues that are potentially in our soul. Therefore, Whoever diligently seeks the true definition of love finds it to be nothing other than an appetite for beauty. Furthermore, under Lorenzo's leadership, the Medici family's financial influence reached new heights, with the gold florin of the Medici bank becoming the standard currency throughout Italy and parts of Europe. Additionally, Lorenzo directed the family's interest towards the alum trade, vital for the cloth industry. The Medici Bank secured a papal monopoly over the alum mines at Tolfa, and in a rare show of force, the Medici even deployed soldiers to sack Volterra, a competing region, thereby consolidating their control over the alum market. Indeed, during Lorenzo's tenure, the Medici family was considered the wealthiest in Europe. However, this period was also marked by financial extravagance, with loans issued that were never recovered. This unsustainable spending eventually led to the depletion of the bank's reserves just two years after Lorenzo's death in 1494. Consequently, the Medici lost control of the Papal treasury to the Pazzi family, their longtime rivals who had previously attempted to assassinate Lorenzo and successfully killed his brother. The Medici's fortunes took a turn for the worse under the rule of Lorenzo's eldest son, also named Piero, dubbed Piero the Unfortunate, leading to their exile. However, the Medici narrative was far from over. A potential path back to power emerged when Giovanni, another son of Lorenzo, ascended to the position of cardinal, opening a new chapter in the family's storied history. The Medici family's journey through history reached an extraordinary pinnacle with the elevation of Giovanni de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent's second son, to the papacy as Pope Leo X in 1513. His ascension to the highest echelon of the Catholic Church marked a moment of unparalleled influence for the Medici family, arguably surpassing even the remarkable achievements of his father. Now, Pope Leo X's tenure at the Vatican, commencing in the early 16th century, was distinguished by the continuation of the Medici's enduring tradition of artistic patronage. Despite the onerous duties inherent in the papal role, Leo X remained deeply committed to the arts, honoring the cultural legacy of his ancestors. This commitment is exemplified by Raphael's renowned portrait of the Medici family, a work that not only showcases Raphael's extraordinary artistic talent, but also embodies the Medici family's stature and their close ties with some of the most celebrated artists of the Renaissance. However, Pope Leo X's papacy also intersected with a turbulent period in the history of the Catholic Church. 
In Protestantism, Leo X is often associated with the controversial practice of selling indulgences, particularly those linked to the funding for the reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This practice, aimed at raising funds for the lavish project, was a significant factor that led to the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which critiqued the sale of indulgences among other church practices, directly challenged the policies of Pope Leo X. In response, Leo issued the papal bull Surge Domini in 1520, condemning Luther's theses and further entrenching the division between the Catholic Church and the nascent Protestant movement. And this papal bull represented an outright rejection of the Reformation and set the stage for ongoing religious conflicts. Pope Leo X's reign, therefore, was a period marked by both cultural flourishing and significant religious strife. While he continued the Medici tradition of fostering the arts, his papacy also coincided with one of the most critical periods in the history of Christianity, and his actions and decisions during this time had lasting implications, not just for the Medici family and the Catholic Church, but also for the broader course of European history. And following Pope Leo X, another Medici ascended to the papacy, Clement VII, presiding over a tumultuous era in the Vatican's history. His reign, which began in 1524 at the tail end of the Italian Renaissance, was characterized by a series of political, military and religious challenges that had profound implications for Christianity and world politics. You see, before becoming Pope, Clement VII had established himself as a skilled statesman, serving with distinction as the chief advisor to his cousin during his papacy and to Pope Adrian VI from 1522 to 1523. But when Clement VII himself assumed the papacy, it was a time of crisis, with the Protestant Reformation fast spreading, the church nearing bankruptcy, and Italy under the threat of foreign invasions. Clement VII initially sought to unify Christendom, and tried to liberate Italy from foreign occupation, seeing it as a threat to the church's freedom. However, the complex political landscape of the 1520s, including the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther, a power struggle in Italy between the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and Francis I of France, and Turkish invasions led by Suleiman the Magnificent, severely hampered his efforts. Further complicating matters was King Henry VIII of England's controversial divorce, which led to England's break from the Catholic Church. The height of his challenges came in 1527 with the sack of Rome, during which Clement himself was imprisoned. His eventual escape from the Castel Sant'Angelo led to a compromise position where he allied with Charles V, his former captor, diminishing the independence of the Church and the Papal States. Despite these challenges, Clement VII was seen as a man of respectability and devoutness. He was noted for his dignified character, theological and scientific knowledge, and astute political insight, and he also left a significant cultural legacy in line with the Medici tradition. He was another family patron of the arts, commissioning works from renowned artists like Raphael, Benvenuto Cellini, and Michelangelo, including the iconic The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. In the realm of science, Clement is notable for his 1533 approval of Nicholas Copernicus's theory that the Earth revolves around the Sun, a groundbreaking endorsement nearly a century before Galileo Galilei's trial for similar ideas. Thus, Clement VII's papacy, marked by considerable strife and challenges, reflects a complex interplay of religion, politics and culture during a transformative era in European history. His contributions to art and science, however, underscore the enduring Medici legacy of patronage and intellectual curiosity. Indeed, the Medicis would need a bit of grit and endurance after the reign of Clement VII, for their empire was soon to decline, as we'll see in the next chapter. Following Clement VII's death, the Medici family encountered a labyrinth of challenges leading to their decline, and central to these tribulations was the faltering Medici Bank. Once the pinnacle of European finance, the bank grappled with liquidity issues post Cosimo Medici's demise in 1464. Liquidity, indeed the lifeblood of Renaissance banking, meant ready cash or assets easily convertible to cash, and the bank's inability to maintain this crucial balance amid the burgeoning economies of Italy's city-states signalled its impending crisis. Its successors, bereft of Cosimo's financial acumen, indulged in lavish lifestyles, draining the bank's resources. Consequently, within three decades, 
the Medici Bank stumbled to its downfall, and the family's woes were compounded by a brewing succession crisis. The absence of a legitimate male heir left the Medici lineage teetering on the brink of oblivion, and Ippolito and Alessandro, both seen as illegitimate, along with the infant Catherine, found themselves at the center of a familial vortex. You see, Catherine, her path to power obstructed by the rigid gender norms of the time, could only watch as the family's influence waned. And this period, marred by uncertainty and political instability, saw the Medici's grip on Florence's political levers loosen as rival factions within the city sensed an opportunity to dismantle their once unassailable dominance. The Medici's height of power reached its final end with the death of Gian Gastone de' Medici in 1737. You see, ascending to power in 1723, Gian Gastone's reign was shadowed by his ill health and an apparent disinterest in public affairs. Despite this, his popularity amongst the Tuscans was undeniable, a sentiment that turned to collective mourning with his passing. Certainly, Gian Gastone's death not only marked the end of his reign, but also heralded the cessation of Medici rule, a dynasty that had shaped the fortunes of Europe for centuries. However, despite their political and financial decline, the Medici's impact, especially in the arts and culture, endured. In a final act of devotion to her city, Anna Maria Luisa, the last Medici heiress, bequeathed the family's extensive art collection to Florence. This grand gesture immortalized the Medici name, ensuring that their legacy would be celebrated and remembered through the ages. Additionally, in Rome, the grandeur of St. Peter's Basilica, one of the largest churches in the world and a masterpiece of Renaissance architecture, is in part a tribute to the Medici popes. Their patronage and vision were pivotal in the creation of this iconic structure, exemplifying their commitment to the arts and their influence in shaping religious and cultural landmarks. And Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance and the Medici's stronghold, houses the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, famously known as the Duomo. Its dome, a work of unparalleled architectural genius by Filippo Brunelleschi, stands as a symbol of the Medici's dedication to architectural innovation and grandeur. And the Medici's architectural influence in Florence extended further to several other landmark structures. The Uffizi Gallery, conceived by Giorgio Vasari, served dual purposes as both an office hub and a display for the Medici art collection. The opulent Boboli Gardens, the formidable Belvedere Fortress, the Medici Chapel with its ornate tombs, and the Palazzo Medici, the family's original domicile, all stand as enduring symbols of the Medici's imprint on Florence. And although their power is greatly diminished, the Medicis are survived by modern-day family members such as Prince Lorenzo dei Medici. To him, the name isn't merely a birthright, but a stewardship which requires him to uphold the values that Cosimo and Lorenzo the Magnificent strive towards. During an interview with Oat Living, he declared that being a Medici has taught me that you need to always have vision and be forward-thinking, but also to consider others in that equation in a philanthropic way. You use your wealth for prosperity of your community and the state, in addition to your family for advancement in culture and in the humanities, fine arts and sciences. You need to give charity to other people in order to elevate society. Thus, the Medici name doesn't stand only for power or wealth, but also for the creation of prosperity and innovation for the community and the world around us. And now we'd like to see you in the comments. Which legendary European dynasty would you like us to cover in depth next? We got a lot of requests to cover the Medici family here, so we're looking forward to providing you the next epic saga. Just be sure to let us know. We'll see you there, and thanks again for joining us for another episode. Cheers, until next time.